Welcome, bench warmers. It is time for Bonus Friday, and we have a very special guest. You've heard him with his beautiful wife, who's working at DNVR uh, Sports here in the Denver area. He's also been on my old podcast that I mentioned, Center of Attention. The guy who hired me into radio and basically cursed all of you to, to listen to me for the next however many years I'm going to do this. Christian Saez is coming back, and we're going to be talking about baseball because, hey, the MLB decided to come out of its hole, and uh, we're going to get baseball. So, Christian, thanks for coming on, and uh, this is going to be something. It's a topic that we haven't discussed a lot, so we're going to be breaking a lot of news to some people today. I'm excited. Hey, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, th- and thanks for having me uh, on the podcast as well, Jimmy. And, uh, you know, I-, I know when we started working together, it uh, feels like decades ago, uh, I, you know, I spent probably a lot more time than you would have liked talking about baseball. So I appreciate you bringing me back to, uh, to share some insight on, on the game and uh, this upcoming season. Yeah, well, it's it's nice that we're going to have a season. It's not that I don't care about baseball, but honestly, baseball has not the MLB has not been doing themselves a lot of favors. There's a ton that we can talk about, and that's basically where we we can pretty much start this thing. The season ends. They're trying to renegotiate a new CBA. It's kind of vague, honestly, what the actual like the normal thing when a strike happens in a professional league, oh, it's millionaires and billionaires arguing over who gets to make more money. Uh, Yes, to some extent. However, this has been brewing for a long time. The owners, I think if you're going to probably go based on professional league uh, as to the relationship between the the players association and the actual owners, MLB has to be just on the furthest parts of the spectrum from each other. Like the MLBPA and the MLB owners have no common interest, it seems like, in this situation. And that's really where this thing came to a head. And since from December 20th, I believe, or December 2nd was the first day that the lockout was official. Um, and then finally, in the last two weeks, it's, it's decided to come back. It's been a long time coming for this situation. It has. And I think that actually was, in my opinion, kind of the, the biggest issue with this whole situation was how long it took to, to reach a resolution, yes, but also to even get the conversation and the ball rolling. Um, it felt like, you know, we, we kind of knew this was coming. If you follow baseball enough, especially in, in the media, you, you can see the writings on the wall that the collective bargaining agreement was, was up and that, you know, negotiation was needing to be, had, was needing to be had. And there, the sides weren't seeing eye to eye. And that's kind of why those two sides exist too. You know, they're the, the, the players association and the MLB are not there to see eye to eye. They're, they're there to kind of defend each other and, um, and, and come to an agreement. The issue that I had with the whole situation was just how long it took for them to start working to an agreement. And it felt like even once the lockout started, um, it took a while for them to actually go into negotiation and go into talks. And I know there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. I know that when you go into ne- negotiation, there's a lot of pr- preparing that both sides have to do. So I- I'm not naive to the fact that there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes than them just sitting around twiddling their thumbs. But I do think with with what was on the line and what was at stake, um, it didn't feel like there was a lot of urgency until the very end. And even at the end, there still felt like there was a little just kind of dragging their, their feet on, on both sides, really. Um, and so that was kind of my biggest issue. But like you said, glad that they got it figured out um, and, and got it figured out without a lot of damage done to the season. We're still going to have a 162 game season. Um, it seemed like both sides were able to come to a, a relatively decent agreement. Um, and now we get to move forward and have baseball. So, you know, all in all, it worked out in the end, but uh, definitely not not a fun process to be a part of, uh, of this season. No, and it, I'm checking my work here. It, the official lockout started on December 20th. The first meeting between the two sides didn't actually happen. It was over Zoom until January 13th. So there you're, you're going again. It it seems almost like I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, just just by myself on the podcast. It seemed almost as if they were so confident like this was back in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s where baseball was a big deal. We think back. I obviously as a Yankees fan, I think back to the last world series that they won. I can't think of a person who I could talk to the next day that wasn't watching the world series. And that's just not the case anymore, but it's almost like the MLB and the MLBPA are the last two to actually figure that out. And this whole, oh, I'm not going to talk to you. You're not going to talk to me. It was hurting both sides, bottom line. And, and that was the whole thing that made no sense. Why aren't they not trying to resolve this? Because once it gets resolved, both sides start making money and have the ability to have a full season again. And that's really like when you talk about when you start talking about canceling games, that's where we saw the urgency flip because that's where baseball makes their money. They're there for you to come out to the ballpark. It's not TV revenue. Well, and I talk about what's at stake and, and, you know, and 
you mentioned it when when they when they started talking about canceling games or actually saying they were going to cancel games it seemed like it kind of lit a bit of a fire for them to to start moving forward more um but I think one of the other things we saw that came up from the, these whole negotiations and the lockout and the situation that unfolded during the off season was that the fact that people and fans are still very invested in baseball as a main sport. Now, granted, yeah, sure. It's not going to get the numbers that football and basketball get, and that's just never going to be the case again, but there is still a large majority of the population that might not even be diehard baseball fans, but still can appreciate baseball as a sport, still enjoy going out getting a beer and going to, to Coors Field to watch the Rockies get smoked every single year. You know what I mean? Like they're hey, still, we got good, Chris but, Bryant. We're going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You guys are good now. No, but, but there's still a population that really likes to, to be involved in this sport. And so, you know, it showed that in a positive way, but I think on the flip side of that is, and, and the, the fine line that major league baseball and the players association were walking is that you were in a position where if you start really canceling baseball games and, cutting the season back even just a, a week or a couple weeks you're you're not, not only is your revenue going to go down in general on both sides you're gonna have to worry about back pay and all these logistics but I think you you really run the risk of losing fans and some some fans being lost for good um you know and, and I know when this happened decades ago it took 10 to 12 years for Major League Baseball to really jump their attendance back to the way that it was um, before that lockout had, lockout had happened. So I, I think Major League Baseball and the Players Association did a good job finding a way to kind of get through this without having any long-lasting effects um, on the game itself. But uh, but I do think they were running a, a pretty big risk um, getting close to the end there if they had ended up starting to cancel a, a week or so into the season. Yeah, and it, it just doesn't seem it, – it honestly – I don't know how involved Manfred is when these negotiations do happen. Uh, it's difficult to put it all on one person, but there's not been a very wor- – not many people who are professional sports league commissioners that have been worse than Rob Manfred in his time. He, he inherited yeah. the basically the end of the Barry Bonds and that whole steroid era and has totally washed the game over to the point where I do think you don't really see a new baseball fan being – created all that often depending on where you live i the analogy on on one of the sports stations here is that baseball is a regional market unless you're six teams think about all the national games that are televised it's the rockies versus the dodgers or not the rockies excuse me the red sox versus the dodgers the yankees versus the red sox or you know you throw st louis games in there because they're crazy about the cardinals outside of that like you don't see the orioles on national tv it's pretty much a regional broadcast at that point. So you're not able to grow the fan base. And then, like you mentioned, canceling games, you're going to kill portions of your fan base. You're going to be left with diehard baseball fans. And I, I hate to tell you, they're old. And that generation of diehard baseball fans just doesn't really exist all that much anymore. There's so much out there to watch. I don't need to sit through a three and a half hour, 11 inning baseball game that isn't going to really do much at the end of things because they play 160 one more of these things so yeah. there's a lot that they need to I think they need to address and it starts at the top yeah and and I think you know you kind of talk about them trying to, to bring the bank the game back up to its former glory um I I don't think that'll ever happen unfortunately and and that and that's honestly not always a bad thing either there are still moments where as a baseball fan you watch uh you know a crazy home run derby or you watch you know a really cool a really close um, you know, walk off home run in in the playoffs or the World Series, you know, and you feel that excitement like you would feel in a football or basketball game. But really, baseball has, has turned into a sport where it's a casual sport. You, like I said, you go, you know, you enjoy spending a nice 80 degree summer day at Coors Field, drinking a beer, watching some baseball and you might get lucky and it'd be a good game. And if not, you still have a good time. And that's and that's OK. And I think Major League Baseball right now is really trying to focus on bringing baseball back to the glory days. And. I just, I, I just don't necessarily see it ever go getting back to to what it used to be, just because of the type of game that it is. You know, you don't go to a, to, you don't go to to the um, to the Masters tournament um, to go watch golf and and expect to see March Madness level excitement. For, yeah. Now you might Lund- get that. Lundquist isn't but, calling that like a basketball game. No, and and you might have moments like that where someone just sinks a massive putt or whatnot, and just like in baseball, someone hitting a walk off home run or whatever. But it's not, you don't go there expecting that. You go there, you know, expecting to just have a nice, casual enjoyment of entertainment. 
And, uh, you know, and, and for, for Manfred and, and how Major League Baseball has kind of progressed, um, I just think there isn't really an identity right now for Major League Baseball. They've been kind of trying to, you know, try new things here or there, you know, say, okay, like we're, we're making baseball fun again. This is baseball is fun now. And then they don't let you, you know, celebrate after a home run. And, you know, and so it's like, there's just, there's just all these kind of back and forths. It's like, yeah, you can have fun, but you just can't do this or you can't do that. And I think that's part of also what, you know, we're going to talk about a little bit today is how major league baseball is progressing and, you know, kind of the, the future of what, what the sport looks like. And is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And um, you know, right now I, it's, it, it's to be determined for sure. I'm still excited for baseball, but um, you know, I'm just not sure what it's going to look like in these next few years. Yeah. There's going to be new things to, to try out. It really, the, the main crux of the issue for me is when they decided that they weren't going to focus on social media, when social media started becoming where a lot of people get their highlights from, it's very mm-hmm. difficult. You don't see a ton of baseball content out there. And you mentioned, you can't even celebrate a home run. So guys, when they're on their own social medias, aren't gaining that big of a following because it's not entertaining to sit there and watch a guy give the same five answers. I think about the baseball content that I've seen the most just in the past few weeks, it's the Savannah bananas, the minor league team, because they do all the TikTok <laughs> yeah. trends while they're yeah. playing the game. And Hey, I know, I don't know if they're any good or not, but at least they're entertaining to watch. And like Trevor Bauer developing new pitches in his suspension, yeah. the guys that are pumping social media content, those are the baseball players that I'd actually care to watch or baseball teams that I'd actually have interest in sitting down and, and taking time away from something else. But right now, like I said, I could, stream something that's probably more entertaining than a baseball game. I could play a video game. That's probably going to be more entertaining. So there's, there's things that I just, it, it seems very tone deaf. I keep coming back to that. And it just seems like, Oh, we're, we're the MLB. We're America's pastime. It's baseball. Everybody loves baseball. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and there is that foundation. I mean, like I said, you know, the, the lockout showed us that people still are very passionate about this sport. People were upset you know, and people that don't aren't usually that vocal about baseball were upset. And, um, you know, and so there is that, that desire still for fans to, to, to keep the sport around there. There is a place for baseball. It's not going anywhere. You know, the the sport isn't, isn't dying. It's just, it's just finding its natural place in the pecking order. And, um, you know, and I do think, you know, you talk about social media and the entertainment side of it. Um, I do think there are people working within the organizations within, you know, let's say, the Rockies organization or, uh, you know, in the minor leagues or, um, you know, even at the corporate level uh, working, you know, in in the social media world or in the content world, there are people that are advocating for that, that recognize that that is the place for change. You know, Fox starting uh, a podcast for a major league baseball podcast, you know I mean? Like stuff like that, where you're seeing that there are people doing that, but it always feels like there's only so far that they can go before major league baseball kind of, doesn't allow them to go any farther. Um, you know, it, it feels like major league baseball, like at the highest level, um, there's, there's kind of this wall, that's this barrier that's still put up, um, whether it be from an executive level, whether it be from, you know, just, just the, 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 the top of the, of the food chain. Um, it feels like there's a barrier up that's kind of not allowing that growth to happen um, beyond just kind of at the lower levels. And so what I really want to see is I want to see, you know, some of the, major league baseball as a whole from the top down really get involved into that content and uh you know creative fun aspect of baseball to the highest extent i think if they can do that you can start to build these fans that might not be uh, natural baseball fans and you talk about you know baseball like we aren't seeing a lot of new baseball fans popping up anymore you're right a lot of the baseball fans that are become or a lot of the people who are becoming baseball fans are kids who are getting born into a baseball family you know like like when I have kids one day my kids will be baseball fans because I'm a baseball fan and Marissa's a baseball fan but we're not seeing people who aren't baseball fans then become baseball fans later in their lives you know and I think that's that's an opportunity of growth where Major League Baseball can really lean into some of the fun parts of the game and some of the fun players like Javier Baez, Fernando Tatis, you know guys who play with a chip on their shoulder, which I don't think major league baseball likes that much, but if you let them kind of do that and be themselves, people will start liking baseball uh, to, to a deeper extent. Um, again, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And the, the fact like the people that love the game under love it because they understand how difficult each of the different aspects are. It may not be the most physically taxing sport. You're not going to have to be the best athlete <laughs> when you play, 
but it is very difficult to catch a fly ball, feel the ground ball, throw a strike as hard as you need to, and, and make sure that somebody doesn't hit it 450 feet. And by the way, guys can hit 450 foot home runs now. So all of these yeah. things, if you think about it, it is so impressive and it should be very easy to market to a fan base. It's just getting yourself to the point where I'm going to focus on marketing it to the fan base. It's almost like, Oh, they'll find it. The, yeah. if, it if they it, want it, to, they'll find it. It's, it is, it, it's, it is really just like they, they, they haven't figured out their identity yet. There's bits and pieces that are there. You know, major league mm -hmm. baseball does care about the content. They care about, you know, the, making baseball fun. It's not like it's the field like, of dreams I, game was a, was like their first, first thing that 100%, they did. hundred percent. Perfect example. Yes. And you know, and there, so there are things that they're doing where you're like, all right, that's on the right track. I just think it's, it's about creating their identity to be that as opposed to it just being something that they're kind of testing out, you know, like the field of dreams thing. Perfect example. That was phenomenal. And people who didn't care about baseball watched that because it was just, it was historic. It was awesome. Almost everyone who likes sports has seen Field of Dreams, whether you wanted to or not. Like that, it was an awesome example of how Major League Baseball took that step. But I'd like to see them consistently taking those steps and taking smaller steps in that regard as well. You know, you don't necessarily have to build a field out of corn and you know throw it back to a movie. You don't have to do that for everything. You can you can do it by supporting you know, those smaller content teams throughout each different organization or supporting the players that are leading by example in that way. Um, and, and I think when it starts from, from like I said, the top down, um, it, it can really have the potential of growing the sport. It's just a matter of making that a reality. So we're going to talk now about kind of the fallout of what happened monetarily, the, the luxury tax and, and the other things player salaries and, and the fact that revenue has gone up, but players aren't getting paid more. Nothing necessarily got really solved there. It's going to change a little bit, fluctuate a little bit. Um, but the teams that want to put their investment towards getting better product on the field and the teams who are really just there to make money are still in that same camp. There was not really a whole bunch of shift in that regard. Um, but the, the new rules that are happening, we you, you've worked in the minor league uh, system. You're a PA announcer and, and called some games for up there in Spokane for that organization. So you, you have some experience in seeing these rules in action. So what, what rule changes have you experienced in person and what, what did you see that worked and what did you see that, that they're going to try that you maybe weren't excited that they're going to implement? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's just to like to follow up on what you were saying. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I spent the last couple of years working um, actually in the Rockies organization um, for the now, the now Rockies organization, um, the Spokane Indians. When I started, we were with the Texas Rangers, the, the low A affiliate of the Rangers. Now we are the high A affiliate for the Rockies. Um, so that's been kind of cool to see kind of how some of the Rockies prospects have um, are, are going to be working their way up the chain, but specifically with the, the new rule changes, uh, the really the only one that I haven't seen implemented at that level was robo umpires. And that's just because they didn't do that um, for a lot of the minor league teams, if any, actually, I think. Um, but to kind of break down the, the rule changes that Major League Baseball is embracing, um, for, first and foremost, is, is the pitch clock. And the pitch clock basically is and I think they're still working on some of the logistics. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but I know it's usually about 19 seconds. I think they're saying something about 16 seconds if a, if a runner's on base. Um, and the idea is just to speed up the game of baseball. So that's one of them. They're getting rid of the shift, which I think is probably the, the biggest rule change from a technical standpoint in the sense that I think baseball has become such a game focused on numbers, analytics, who can hit the ball where and when and how many times and where are we going to put this guy in the field and you know, are we going to throw, are we going to bring a, a reliever in to just throw pitch to one batter and then take him out? You know, are we going to start with an opener? I mean, all these different crazy things that baseball has, has learned from the numbers, which is really an interesting part of the game. Um, that I think is one of the most changing uh, aspects of these rules uh, of these new rule changes where you're, I think you're going to get, uh, um, it's going to change the game a lot. Um, and so we can kind of go into that as well. And then the last one, that I'm aware of is that they're just making the bases a little bit bigger. Um, the idea behind the base changes is to, you know, um, make it a little bit safer. First of all, people aren't getting their, their hands stepped on as many times, but also, um, you know, increasing stolen bases and uh, you know, making the, if, if a guy, you know, we see all the time 
those really close plays at first when a guy's hustling down the first baseline and the umpires, you know, make a, a quick bang, bang call and they have to go watch it on replay. They're kind of trying to allow those to become hits now, as opposed to it be a very close out. Um, so trying to make the game more enjoyable, make it more offense focused. So those are the three main rule changes that we're looking at. Um, and, and I, I want to start initially by talking about the pitch clock. Um, and then I'll kind of give you a chance to, to give your thoughts on that. But the pitch clock is one that I, that I noticed the most uh, in the minor league system, just because um, it was new. You know, I, I pitched and played my whole life um, all the way up until I ended up, you know, going and working in the minor league system. And so I had, I had pitched without a, a clock my entire life. And then seeing that implemented, that was really interesting to me because I am the type of pitcher that likes to go super fast, move very quickly. Yep. That's just the rhythm that I'm in. But there's so many pitchers out there that are very slow about how they go about things. They, they could take 45 seconds in between pitches. Um, and that's just their process. So I, I, what, I, what I was noticing, though, and I think one of the biggest takeaways that I found in, uh, in watching this in the minor league system is that when, when, it, when you're telling someone, hey, there's a pitch clock, like you can't, you know, you, you've got 19 seconds before you got to throw your next pitch. It, it's, I guess it's, an, it's initially a bit of an annoyance probably, but no one really thinks about it. Like once you get out there on the mound, the, the slow pitchers speed up, the fast pitchers just keep doing what they're doing. It doesn't really change anything. But the biggest thing that I took away from it is that for me, it felt more, uh, I wanted to kind of define it more as a play clock and not a pitch clock because the biggest issue with it was that the pitchers might be on time, but the batter's took a long time. Sometimes they'd step out of the box in between pitches. They'd take three or four practice swings. They, you know, wave to their girlfriend in the stands, you know, I mean, they were just having a good old time and a pitcher's on the mound ready to go. And that I think is the biggest struggle where it's like, Hey, the pitcher might be ready and ready to go within his time limit. The umpires need to to really get consistent about keeping the batters uh, up to date with that clock as well. Yeah, I was going to say any two-hole hitter worth his salt is not going to just stand in there and let a pitcher throw a pitch every 19 seconds. That's kind of what they're there for. Uh, those are all actually the, – the other thing about those rules is that they're not being implemented in the games that are coming up that are going to be starting on April 9th. Those are for the 2023 season. So they yeah. are going to be taking the time to hopefully – you'd like to think that they're taking the time to make these rules better. Honestly – with the track record that we've seen is with all of all of the major sports leagues, when they're going to have time to think about something, it'll be a last second. Oh, I guess we'll, we'll implement this. Uh, and nobody will have thought about this for the entire time until it's implemented. Um, the pitch clock is an interesting one, but the defensive shift, I'm interested by, by just by your initial take, I couldn't tell if you're for banning the shift, if you're against banning the shift. I think that it's going to be good because it kind of brings it back to a a realistic level of baseball and and you're not going to deal with all the analytics nerds. You can hit for average and and not have to swing out of the park. So are you for or against banning the shift? Uh, I agree with you, actually. Um, I'm, I'm for it. Uh, I I think there is some, there there is a very mental side of the shift being in place. You know, if you like baseball, you've played baseball, you get what's happening it makes sense. And you kind of think about it like that, but not everyone thinks about baseball in that way. There are so many fans out there that aren't ex players or, or maybe have never played in in their lives. And I know my mom is a diehard baseball fan. She's never played softball or baseball ever in her life. She just grew up watching it. And so for people like that, who might not have played the game, but have watched it a long time and been fans, I think this makes the game fun in a way that you just described where you you're now, now you're going to get guys who are hitting, or you're, you're the, they're going to be hitting for contact, you know, because you realize that, Hey, that, you know, I, if I'm, if, if I know that the, the guy, that the place that I'm hitting to um, doesn't have someone there or, or they're not moving over, you can kind of hit to contact a little bit more. You can get away with some of those nice ground balls. You, you, you know, and before you were seeing a lot more strikeouts, a lot more guys saying, well, Hey, I, I only pull the ball and we've got, all the guys on the, in the field out on the left side of the, the field where I hit it every time. Well, I just need to hit a home run now. So they either hit a home run or they strike out. So I, I'm in favor of them doing this because I do think it gets back to the basics. And I like at times having a bit of a balance between baseball being very a complicated, very thoughtful sport, but also being basic and just yeah. being able to kind of stay to its, its core values. And, um, and also, you know, the other part of it too, is that you're really not, 
banning a shift entirely when when you actually think of what a shift is you the players just have to stay in the dirt really so if if you got a guy coming up to hit and you know you know he pulls it a little bit and you're the shortstop and he's a he's a, a righty well you're going to move over a couple steps towards third base so you know, that's just yeah. like that's just part of the game you're not going to get away from guys recognizing and acknowledging what's happening um and and who they're facing you're just not going to see a third baseman playing center field when you got a lefty who can pull the crap out of the ball. Um, and, you know, and then also when the pitcher releases the ball, the players can move back to wherever they want. Now, granted, that's not a lot of time, but the minute the p- pitcher throws it, you can move. So I just think it's, it's not as big as it seems, but I do think it will have an effect on just how the game is played. And I think the p- people will just have to get used to it initially. Yeah, it's not going to make everybody – there's not going to be a designated area where all the players have to, to stand. You know from playing, I know from playing. You Sometimes you def- align yourself defensively based on the pitcher that's throwing. If you got a guy that can yeah. throw, throws gas and you're playing third base, if it's a left-handed batter, I'm hugging the line because he's not going to catch up to the fastball that this guy can throw. So yeah. it is – like, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I'll take it even further. When I, when I was playing outfield, I'd play center field, and a lot of times I could see the signs – that the catcher's thrown down and I could see, okay, all right. My, my catcher just threw down a curveball. Well, I I'm going to move for that, you know, and the batter doesn't know. I mean, you know, and you got to be careful that you're not too obvious about it, but the batter didn't know why I was moving, but I knew that, Hey, he's going to be throwing a curveball. This guy throws hard. So the the batter's probably going to be out in front of this or whatever, you know? And so I think, you know, you, you still can kind of move within those ideas and within those boundaries. And you also have to think about it from other sports too. You being a football guy, I'll make this example. Uh, illegal formations, you know, like it's, it's the same thing, but football recognizes that, Hey, if you line all the guys up on one side of the line of scrimmage, it's going to be a little unfair. So we're going to make sure that you are lining up in a formation. That's that balances the the playing field. Same thing with basketball. If you put Shaquille O'Neal under the basket and just let him sit there all game long, that's unfair. So that's why you have that, you know, you, you can only stay in there for a few seconds before you have to get out and move around. So I think it's just it's weird because baseball hasn't done this yet, but I do think it once it becomes normal, it, people will forget it even exists. I think that they, these rules are going to be met with backlash initially, just because people are not going to like change, especially in a sport where that has the traditions that baseball holds so dearly to itself. In a, in a way, this is bringing baseball back to more of the traditions. It, it had got away from that because of the shift and because of the analytics and Moneyball. And now you're kind of bringing it back to more of its natural state. It's, it's honestly, it's one of the more exciting things that came out of this whole situation. Uh, I also really like the the bases being bigger for as fast and as athletic. They're not the best athletes like we talked about, but there are guys that can move now. And there's baseball yeah. players that are doing things that baseball players t- 10, 20 years ago could not do. So expanding and giving themselves a little bit, selves a little bit more room and now increasing the amount of steals because catchers can throw 120 from the back of the plate. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to change some things with the amount of athleticism we're seeing in the game now. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, I can, from watching how they've done this in the minor leagues, um, you know, throughout the, the bases being bigger in the minor league system, that has increased uh, stolen bases, one extra stolen base per game. So we're seeing one, we're seeing one more stolen base per game than what we were with ba- without the bases being um, being the, the regular size that they are now. So that alone just shows me that hey, this that that even if guys aren't actually getting that stolen base, even if they're getting thrown out, it, that alone gives me if I'm a guy like Javier Baez who can who can flat out run and, and likes to take those those bases when they can you know, that's going to give me more of an incentive to say, Hey, just those really close plays. I got that. Like if it's, if it's close, I'm going to get it now. And so you, you get guys that are, like you said, kind of speeding up the game from a physical standpoint, stealing is be, can become a little bit more prominent. You're not going to, you're not going to change the game entirely, but I do think it's a slight improvement that will help positively. And I haven't really seen any negative aspects of making the bases bigger besides that people are just kind of like eh, like why why not just leave it as is besides that there isn't really a good argument that i've heard on leave on on not making the bases bigger um so i, I agree with you i think that is a positive one i do really want to i quickly want to go back though um to the to the, the pitch clock just because i i had written these stats down and i wanted to to kind of throw this out there so you know with the pitch clock 
having been implemented already in the minor leagues, what we saw is that the, the game time actually did decrease by 20 minutes. Um, so we did see that Major League Baseball got a little bit of what they were asking for. They're saying, okay, if we're keeping pitchers moving, the game is going to go a little bit quicker. So that's a good thing. But on the flip side of that, uh, we saw player batting average increase by over 30 points. So what the correlation could be kind of given there is that, yeah, some pitchers who work a little bit slower take time. They're not able to go into that rhythm as much. And so hitters are, are kind of taking advantage of that. Do you see that as a good thing or a bad thing, you know, that this is becoming a little bit quicker games and you're seeing hitters doing better? Uh, I mean, the batting averages were so low. The 30-point increase kind of brings them back up to the mean. The the colloquial saying about baseball is you three out of 10 and you're an all-star. So it was yeah. kind of getting down to 2.5 out of 10 and you're an all-star. So I, I don't mind that. Um, it, it, it could, I mean, I think it's just going to make the pitchers have to adapt. We're already starting to see that. I listened to Marcus Stroman talk and the way that he has that little hitch in his windup, it is just to throw that timing off a little bit more. So if you're not able to slow play it, you're going to figure out a new way to throw off a batter's timing. You give a little extra shoulder shake and something that's these guys, they play for six months out of the year, but they're working and developing new things. Trevor Bauer is coming in, coming back to the game with about three new pitches that he's developed and they're all nasty and he can throw all of them for strikes. That's what he's been doing in his time off. So yeah. I, I think that it's just going to allow for a little bit of, of change and we're going to see athletes adapt. The same thing people were talking about the NFL changing the rules to be so offensive heavy. We're still seeing really good defenses win, especially at the highest level. The Rams don't win the Super Bowl this past season without a really good defense. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, by the way. The uh, Bengals losing to the Super Bowl. Uh, the <laughs> Bucks don't win last year against the Chiefs without a really good defense. And the Chiefs, if their defense didn't step up two years ago or three years, three years ago now against San Francisco, they don't win their Super Bowl. So, yes, the rules seem a little bit more offensive, but in the big moments, it's going to be pretty much the same. We're not going to see too much of a change. The numbers will be skewed initially. It is not going to be that big of a deal, I don't feel like. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I think baseball is a game of adaptations, you know, you, you, especially pitchers where you're, you're adapting throughout the game. If there's a, if guys are hitting your, your curveball, then you've got to, and maybe that's your best pitch. You've got to figure out how you're going to get through the, the next few innings. And that's just, that's just the way, that's just the way it is. So, you know, I, I think it's like you said, people don't like change. Um, the players I think are probably, less concerned about this kind of stuff because they're just going to go out and play one way or another. Um, it's more of, I think on the fans, just kind of feeling like, ah, I don't, I don't really want it to change. I don't want new things to pop up. I like the way it was. Um, but that's just part of the game. And just like football, you, you mentioned that. Um, and I do like that, that baseball feels like they are recognizing or major league baseball feels like it's recognizing offense being a driver of the enjoyment of the game. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm a pitcher. I love watching a pitching duel, but if you're, if, if you have a game seven of a world series and you've got a ton of fans that maybe aren't, or a ton of people watching that maybe aren't huge baseball fans and it's a, you know, two hit pitchers duel, that might be cool for me. Yeah. I, I would enjoy that, but the fans probably wouldn't like that as much. So people want the home runs. They want all that. I like that baseball is trying to kind of get back to, uh, you know, creating a more offensive minded approach. Um, and speaking of that, I wanted to kind of talk about a potential, not rule change, but um, something that is actually kind of included almost in fine print in the new CBA. It's tentative. Um, it's something that they're going to start discussing, but it's the idea that the all-star, if the all-star game was to end in a tie in the ninth inning, that they would then resort to a home run derby after the all-star game after the nine innings are being uh, have been played in the, in the all-star game, they would go into a home run derby to decide who wins the American league or the national league. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's a shootout. Like now you're just copying hockey and man, that's not the professional league to copy. People hate shootouts. Uh, oh, and see, I, I see. And I saw that. And I'm like, that's sick. Cause I, cause don't get me wrong. Like, you know, the all-star game is the only all-star game, in my opinion, in all of professional sports that actually is enjoyable to watch, or at least has some sort of value from a fan base, you know, like, like football, the pro bowl is just garbage. You know I mean? You just, yeah. I mean, you, it, 
I think if you're a if you're a diehard fan, you watch it just because it's more no, football. No, but like that's no, I don't. It's not you don't even football. Yeah, yeah. They they legitimately yeah. didn't tackle Mac Jones for fifty yards. This yeah, year. It's yeah, not exactly. football. I don't watch. It's not. No, you're you're right. You're right. Yeah. So, but so you know, Major League Baseball. I don't get me wrong. It's fun to watch the All Star game, and and there is a bit of that. Like, ah, oh, well, like if it's a really good game, like I I kind of want to see it finish. But let's be honest. We all the the thing we all enjoy most is the home run derby. And if you get to a tie game in the bottom of the ninth and, or in the, you know, in the top of the 10th, I should say, mm-hmm. and I have the, the opportunity to watch more home run derby, especially in a chance where, you know, you're going to get a home run, a, a new home run derby champion type of thing that wins the all-star game. I'm on board with that. Hit, throw me, throw me some more home runs. I have no idea how that would work from a logistical standpoint. I don't know what that would look like on paper. But just how many guys do you think are going to be able to play a full game and then go out and compete well in a home run derby? Exactly. That's what I mean. I don't know what the logistics of that look like, Yeah. but like I said, it comes back to the more home runs, the better. I'll take it. it. Aaron judge and John Carlos Stanton are just going to be transferred around teams, like teams (laughs) that are in extra innings a lot. If it stays, as just the all-star game. I'll be okay with that. I think that's something like, the fact that the All-Star game also decides who's home and away in the World Series, I don't even know if it, it still does. That It used to be the case. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it does anymore. Yeah. That was – I mean, that's another thing that makes it cool. So, I'm yeah. okay with it that way. Honestly, I, I don't mind the California rule for extra innings. I like having the runners start on second, especially mm-hmm. now that we're talking with no shifts. It makes a whole lot, whole lot more sense to do that with no shifts because you're having the ability to move the runner around or possibly get a stolen base. So – I, I would much prefer that over the home run derby as just an extra innings rule in general. But for the all-star game, yeah, uh, those guys yeah. are all going to be power hitters anyways. So I'll, I'll take it. I, we watched uh, – I didn't catch Vladdy Jr.'s home run that he hit in the all-star game because we were actually uh, – my Nico and, and a couple of our buddies from high school went to the all-star weekend since they moved it to Colorado this year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I didn't catch it, but I did find the guy who caught that ball. And I will tell you – that's the easiest conversation with a complete stranger that I've ever started in my life because we were all excited. He caught the home run ball. I was like, Hey, I'll buy you a beer. If you let me hold the ball and take a picture with it. He's like, yeah, cool. No, you're going to buy me a beer. Just grab it and run. <laughs> uh, I, I could, but you know, yeah. I was, I, I enjoyed the guy. I, I gave him, I got him his beer. He, he gave me a picture with the ball. So I, I think that that situation and that setup at the all-star game works. It seems a little kind of hokey pokey to me if they do it, if they implement it in every single game. I don't know. That's, yeah, no, that's kind I, of where and, I stand. And God, that I think that would be, yeah, hit with a ton of, of pushback. Um, I, I think it was just, just for the all-star game. I think the idea is that baseball really can go into like 20 innings if you let it. And so I think the idea I watched more, that, that all-star game that went 17. My dad and I stayed uh, up for that whole thing. It was uh, not, dude. it was the wrong move. I'll be honest with no, you. The only, yeah, only I, saving grace was it was the summer. So. Yeah, God, I, I can't even imagine. That was, uh, yeah, I, I love baseball, but that, no, unless it's my team and in, in a time, in a game that matters or I'm at the game, no, I'm going to bed. I'm going to bed. Yeah, but the, with the All-Star game, I mean, I think that would be cool because, like I said, I, I think, that, I mean, and even if you look at it from a business standpoint, the, the Home Run Derby is where is where they get their revenue. Their Home Run Derby gets gets almost as much as a, as a late playoff game, you know, from a viewer, viewership and um and I think there was actually some stats saying that home run derbies, sometimes the home run derby gets almost equivalent to what the world series picks up. So you're, you're thinking of ad, you're, you're talking about a, a game that adds literally an entire world series game worth of, of viewership to the major league baseball's revenue. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you be trying to put as many little home run derbies in as you can? And if that just means throwing a tiebreaker home run derby in after a tied all-star game, I'll take it. That's fine. I agree. Don't put it in the, don't put it in the regular season, but uh, get, get weird with the all-star game. That's, that's all, all fun and games. Yeah. That's pretty much all it was. I mean, from the prospect game to the actual home run derby and then uh, the all-star game itself, it was, it's a totally different feel than the games that I've been to at Coors Field where they're just regular, regular season games, mainly yeah, because I'm, I'm bummed. I'm bummed that I wasn't here when that happened. I mean, I know, I mean, at that point, Marissa and I, we didn't have any knowledge that we were moving to Denver, yeah. but God, we missed it by just just a year, man. We were close. It it was uh it was a strange because it was after they moved it from Atlanta because of the voting yeah. law, and then it, it was there was a lot like that was I I thought they were going to take it away from Colorado, honestly, with the amount of backlash that they got initially. Um, so 
it was it was a cool experience. I don't think we're ever going to get another one, or maybe we will in another fifteen years. That's about the timeline that they gave. But yeah, I mean, Dude, it was it was almost as surprising as you guys getting Russell Wilson. Like, yeah, <laughs> you, you kind of woke up one day and you were like, "Wait, yeah. we, we're getting an All Star game this year? Like, what? Yeah. what? We, Why are we getting the All Star game?" <laughs> we were on uh, our our network at that point, and Nico and I didn't even know it was happening then it got switched to Colorado and then we got a message in our our network group chat and they're like oh you guys are so lucky they just moved it to Colorado I was like I texted Nico I said is this is this true like they know the Rockies suck right yeah yeah right it's hey, not hey, a, that's the, give it to a sucky team man because that like it gets the fans out there because the people the people in Denver they just want we want something to cheer for like I I, I was telling my mom because I, I I really wanted to go to opening day on the 8th and uh, and, and I can't because I'm Marissa and I, we, we've got a wedding we're going to in Nashville. Um, but I was telling my mom, I'm like, I'm super bummed. Cause yeah, like you got the rest of the season. I can go to any game I want. You know, I'm, I live literally like 15 minutes down the street from the, the stadium. But, but like, let's be honest, the only game that's going to be worth going to from a like sold out fun standpoint is opening day. From that point on, it's going to be just like, yeah, you go to have a beer and just hang out and chill. And that's just baseball, but it's not like it's going to be a, uh, it's not like it's going to be, I'm not expecting it to be uh, too exciting throughout the rest of the year. I will tell you that the, the Monforts, uh, Monforts, they market their game as to come out and enjoy a beer at the stadium and watch your team. So not that they don't market it to the Rockies fans. They market it to the teams that are coming in. So when the Giants come, you should go to those games Dude. because it's oh, going to be a Giants home game. Oh yeah. And, and I am, I am so, so excited to be in the division that the Giants are in. Because, yeah, I mean, living in Washington before going to Mariners games, the Giants would come one, once every three years, two years. And, of course, you know, my mom and I would be at the game decked out in Giants. And, and it made it more fun because because they weren't in the same division, uh, you know, and they only played once every few years. Everyone in, in Seattle who is a Giants fan, which there's a lot because it's the West Coast, all of us would come to the game. So it did kind of feel like a, a home game anyways. But, yeah, now that I'm in Colorado and it, it happens – more consistently uh, playing, you know, the, the Giants. I'm even the Dodgers opening day. I'm like, God, I hate the Dodgers. I'll come watch and and, and root against the Dodgers any day. Like that's that's sweet. I I would give you the advice to not root against the Dodgers in that situation because it is a Dodgers home game and they're you're going to be outnumbered. Um, yeah, you, but, you might you know, even be able to go in a Mariners shirt and be in the majority in that when the Mariners <laughs> come to Colorado. For hey. It's been so. I, I've got plenty. I've got plenty of Mariners jerseys, and uh, and yeah, I, I'm sure when the Mariners, if the Mariners come to town, that I'll be uh, I'll be rocking one of them. I've got my Ken Griffey Jr. Air Force Ones. I'll be bringing out. Yeah, it'll be a good time up at Coors. Um, uh, so I know that you're we're we're kind of coming up on an hour, and I did want to talk about the Rockies since the games are going to be starting. But before we we get to that, the other rule change that I wanted to kind of float past you: the expansion of the playoffs. That that oh, yeah. yeah. That I think that's actually the MLB looking around and going, wow, adding teams to the playoffs is, is good because initially for the NFL, people thought it was going to be too much. And then we added an extra week to the regular season. So it was never going to be too much. I think that this is a great thing. Uh, and, and it adds the fact that the MLB, like we mentioned, is basically a six team national market and just a whole bunch of regional markets you're getting these regional markets to actually have a shot at the playoffs like if the extra team happened last season the Rockies would have actually been in playoff contention until June instead of being out in July or out in May so I think it's a great thing to have 12 teams in the MLB postseason moving forward yeah um I I, I get people's initial reaction about you know oh it's going to be too much it's going to be too overwhelming uh my my initial my my, my response to that is Think of one of, I would say, the second greatest sporting period, second to the Super Bowl in, in, in America, which is currently happening, March Madness. Think of how many teams play in March Madness. So granted, it's a different format. It's a bracket format. Format You have, you know, it's a one and done. Baseball is obviously not like that. But if you actually look at it on paper, basketball or, or March Madness, I mean, from a logistical standpoint, I mean, there is a ton of teams, a ton of games. I can't even watch all of the games at the beginning and mm -hmm. all of them are good. You know, it's like every single one of them. I'm, I'm bummed that I didn't get to see that specific random little team play or whatever, but it's one of the greatest sporting periods tournaments in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think that baseball obviously not going to get on that level, 
But I think baseball adding more teams gives you that feel a little bit because you get teams, like you mentioned, that might not have normally had a chance to get in the conventional way, but kind of get in through the back door. I like it. Same thing with the wild card. You know, like I love watching uh, or the Rockies even a few years ago when they when they uh, yeah, made it to we, the wild card game. We that were on pumped. the radio when they were playing in that wild card yeah, game. Yeah, I was I was pumped, man. Yeah. Like, and, and that was fun. And the Rockies wouldn't have gotten to that in a conventional playoff setting. And it was, and it allowed that to, to kind of happen. And you see it in basketball, March Madness, you see the St. Peter's, you know, coming out here and, and who the hell are they or Eastern Washington last year, you know, when they put up a fight against mm-hmm. the number one seed team and almost won. And, you know, us Cheney Washington people are like, you know, we've got our name out there for once in our lives. So I just think it kind of gives you that opportunity where you get teams, like you said, like the Rockies, even um, in a lot of ways where, you get to kind of be a fan for longer. And even if, even if your team gets out, you know, there are other teams that might not be conventional playoff teams, but they get a chance. And, uh, and sometimes, especially in a sport like baseball, that's all you need is just a chance. And um, so I, I'm in, I'm in favor of it as well. Yeah. I mean, the more chances for an upset to happen, the more likely there is going to be one that does happen. And the Rockies have never won the NL West. They've never made the playoffs as the division winner. That one time really? that they made it to that. the, it, 25 years or now 27 years, no, no NL West titles. It's always been the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks won it the, the season huh. that the Rockies made it to the world series. So yeah, if any fan base should be excited about it, I guess it's the Rockies, but honestly, I, I gave you the assignment to try and look at the Rockies and see if there's any kind of hope, but what are we doing? We're, we're giving away Trevor story and Nolan Arenado. So the conventional wisdom there says, okay, we're tanking so that we can get better in the future we paid $50 million on Nolan Arenado's contract. We let Trevor story walk in free agency. Oh, and then we just spent $230 million or whatever it is to get Chris Bryan in here. Who's a, a nice player. I think Nolan Arenado is a better player at this point in his career. Chris Bryant's old on the backside of his career. You're getting probably four years out of Chris Bryant. So what are the Rockies doing? What's happening on Blake street? Dude, I do not, I, I do not like, um, the move as, as, as a Rockies, as a now Rockies fan being here, obviously not to the level of the giants, but like as being here, living here, following the Rockies, I don't like it. Um, as a giants fan, I love it. Cause Hey, I get, you know, Chris Bryant, who is a giant. He ha- was with them when they, you know, God, had a phenomenal season last year. So let's go like bring him here. But for the Rockies, I just think you spend way too much money. And, and, and I agree with your point for a guy that's just not, he doesn't have the longevity. Um, It actually really feels like a lesser version of if the Broncos had ended up getting Aaron Rodgers, you're going to end up giving up a lot to get a a guy who's good. Sure. And has a big name, but he's definitely on the, the, the quick downhill of his, of his career. And I think the the Rockies really, uh, in my opinion, should have focused more on getting like a Russell Wilson who, who has, you know, a, a lot more time left and is still a very good active player. Now, granted, not everyone can be George Payton and just have some crazy card in his pocket that, that he can pull. But um, I think, you know, Chris Bryant fills a, a, a hole, but you have the entire rest of the, of the playing field to fill. And yeah. so you spend a lot of money that you could have spent rebuilding and, um, and you spend it all on one or two guys, Ryan McMahon, um, another one who's I'm glad that the Rockies are, are going to stick with, but um, are, are you rebuilding a team with those two guys? No, you're not. And that's just kind of where I'm at with that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic because like I said, my giants, you know, last year, they, they were able to kind of put together this historic, literally the most wins in, in the history of baseball um, in one season run with guys that were our, minutes away from retirement and no one knows who, who the other ones are. And so like, you know, if the giants can do that, anything can happen, but I'm cautiously optimistic or I, I'm cautiously hesitant, I guess I, I should, I should say about the Rockies this year and just the, the foundation that they have to be able to put it together as a complete package. So as somebody who's kind of got an outside perspective, um, do you believe in, in kind of the course field curse or, or the mile high curse it's difficult. You're not going to be able to build a team 
in the same way I don't think in Colorado that you would be able to build in San Francisco because San Francisco is a notoriously difficult place to hit home runs, and that's just not not the case here. It's difficult to pitch in Colorado. The pitchers don't get the respect. The hitters don't get the respect they deserve. Um, Todd Held and Larry Walker are, are guys that are just seen as getting to the Coors Field bump. Um, do you – buy into that do you think that the Rockies could maybe put together something similar to maybe a a a Giants type roster or is it is this a place where you're going to have to build up a a bombing lineup and hope that you win all your games at home and and you can hit on the road as well because that's basically kind of the the two schools of thought yeah I I do think there is some truth to you know where you play and like you mentioned the the Giants the you know Oracle Stadium or used to be AT&T Park um, it is not a home run park at all. And, and, you know, and that, that is reflected and say, and then with Coors, it is, it's the flip side of that. And those do play a factor because yeah, you, you got to be able to have a pitching staff that can manage that if you're, if you're playing at Coors. Um, but I do, but I think what it comes down to in the deepest level, um, and I, I've used this word a handful of times and I'll use it again. It's just the identity of, of the Rockies, the Rockies right now feel like they're kind of just piecing things together, but they're not, looking at the the whole picture and what the giants did last year where they were able to put a bunch of misfits and washed up, you know, theoretically washed up players together to be a a world series contending team and the best team in all baseball going into the playoffs um, are playing the second best team in baseball. Um, You know, they, they did it by embracing this veteran leadership and then bringing in new guys and, and kind of leaning on that veteran leadership to kind of, create this kind of Island of misfit toys type of atmosphere. And they, and they did that all around, even the, the man, the coaching staff, Gabe Kapler and uh, you know, leading, leading the, 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 the way it just felt like their identity was that Island of misfit toys. And they embraced that and they just, and that was what made them successful for the Rockies. Yeah. You're getting, you're, you're paying a lot of guys or a lot of money for, for a guy like Chris Bryant, who's got a big name and he's, he's pretty good. He'll, he'll produce if he stays healthy. But, you know, besides that, what else is there? There isn't really an identity. You're, you know, now, yeah, you get rid of Trevor Story, you get rid of Arenado, and you, you know, you're, you're, you lock in uh, Ryan McMahon. And these are good moves here or there. There are, there are good moves here or there, but it just doesn't feel like they're all leaning towards one identity. Is it going to be a rebuild? Is it going to be this type of team? Is it going to be that type of team? Are we going to get our Russell Wilson that, literally like doesn't matter who else we have he's just the guy we are going to lean on which would be in my opinion like a like a Mike Trout or like a Bryce Harper you know someone like that that you can just say it doesn't matter who else we have he's just the one we are focusing on I just the Rockies didn't do that they haven't done that so like I said baseball is a surprising game you get the you know teams like the Giants or the Oakland A's who no one would ever expect them to be playoff or world series contenders. And they, they happen to be, I just don't see that happening with the Rockies this year. Yeah. It's very, they take on, but I like Bud Black. I like Bud Black as a person. He'd be, I think he'd be a decent coach. He obviously knows, knows what he's doing. He's been around for a long time, but the team has taken on his personality. and, And that almost seems like a detriment at this point too, because Bud Black is a go with the flow kind of guy and the players you got the Kyle Freelands that are hearing everything that the media is saying about this team. And it's warranted because we just laid it out there. They are caught half in a rebuild, half in a win. Now half in a, we've got to make sure people come out to the ballpark. Uh, they're, they're scattered so far and spreading themselves so thin and only worried about making money from the team instead of actually building a team that could play. And you, you'll make more money when the team is successful. That's what I just, the Monfarts seem to think that that's that's not a thing that happens. Yeah, well, and and I think you you actually brought up another piece, and I think it's actually really an important piece is that you know you you look at the guys on the Rockies right now, and um, whether they're good or not, whether they're you know guys who are all stars or just kind of regular guys, they are right now in a very kind of confusing, not confusing, but a very weird environment here in Denver because now you you have the Denver Broncos who are a full on Super Bowl contending team and the entire state of Colorado is absolutely fired up to watch them play. And, and for this season, I am not remotely close to as big of a football fan as you are. And I am pumped up to see them play this year. You've got the Denver, the Denver nuggets who are riddled with injuries yet still a 
above average team now and they, they have the know, mvp it, and they have well oh god and they and they have the best bat, player in all of basketball right now yeah. and then you have the avalanche who are literally the best team in all of hockey so and also have the best player in the world there too <laughs> yes so you're you're in this phenomenal sports market right now where everyone else and the rapids let's not forget the rapids yeah. who are all you know last year were, were a phenomenal team in their own aspect so you've got this like huge, amazing sports market here in Denver that is just crushing it right now. And then you have the Rockies and then you have the Rockies and, and, you know, and you see on social media, you know, especially when Russell Wilson got signed, uh, everyone and their mother was posting about it and they're posting about, we've got, they were realizing we've got the abs, we've got the nuggets, we've got the Broncos now. Oh yeah. And we have the Rockies, you know, and they, they were always like that that little guy in the corner just kind of sitting there like, yeah, I'm still here. And, and that's hard for players who are coming in here or who, or who know their worth, you know, and, and can sit there and say, Hey, I'm a really good player right now. And I deserve to be in a winning market. They're not going to want to play here. They're not going to want, they're not going to have that motivation. And there might be some guys that end up taking this as on with a chip on their shoulder. Like we're going to prove them wrong. But I think overall, it's going to be hard for a lot of guys to, to acknowledge where the Rockies are right now. And, and that's going to be something that, that I think is going to be a struggle for a lot of the players this year as they try to kind of navigate the season in literally arguably the best sports market currently in the country, at least from a, from a, you know, future talent standpoint. Yeah. Three out of the four major teams right now are in a championship window, which is Nico and I talk about it all the time. The fact that we're living in Colorado in the, in the point where we can, talk about avalanche and nugget playoff basketball and hockey and now the broncos even the fact that colorado is not a baseball state when the rockies and broncos were bad last year nico and i took took turns giving shots to the rockies like taking heat off the broncos Uh, yeah we know they lost but hey the rockies just gave up more runs than the broncos scored on offense so yeah we don't need to worry too punching bag yeah, it, it, like you could always turn something right back around to the Rockies unless they happen to win one of their 30 games or whatever they won last year. So it, it, that's the other bad part, too, is that this state will never embrace you unless you're good. And they you won't be good until they, they embrace you and the ownership and management embraces you. And, and it's going to probably come with a, a full clean house at some point, but it's going to, it's not coming under the Monfords. They're dude, enjoying how, swimming in their cash. <laughs> yeah, dude, how crazy would it be? If uh, in some foreign planet where, where this where this situation exists, if the Rockies were the only team to win a World Series in the next five years or win a championship in the next five years out of any Bronc or any uh, Colorado sports team, oh, I would be just absolutely heartbroken. I would I'd you? To... Yeah. Would, would it be? Wor- would you rather have the talent that that Denver sports has right now and have none of them win a championship, or have? I don't know. It's, it's even a hard question, but like have, you know, have them not have this crazy talent, but have one championship out of all of the teams in the next five years. I, if it's an avalanche Stanley cup, I'll be okay with that. that. That's the one team championship that I'm, I'm willing to trade for anything. Like all of them. It, it's not the Rockies. Yeah. It's not the, I'm not trading anything for the Rockies. The Rockies <laughs> are not on the bargaining table. They're on the bargaining <laughs> table. Just be, shipped off like not mentioned yeah. on the podcast anymore we didn't talk we didn't say Garrett Bowles name for like the first six months that we did this show and now it's about time that we're not talking about the Colorado Rockies because it's just it's too much effort to put in to talk about how bad they are when you know that they're not putting in the effort to get any better and they're perfectly content with being where they are like a they, 50 they gotta, and 72 ball club is perfect for them yeah they they gotta they gotta earn it and that's that's my thing and don't get me wrong I you know I I know it, it sucks to be on a team that is struggling and it's you know and it it stem it, it comes from all sides you know it's not just one person um, but you know you, you've got to earn it you know they they the Rock, Rockies fans right now are are upset they're angry uh, and I see it even you know my, like you said my wife she she you know runs the social media uh, accounts for DNBR and and yeah you know getting into baseball season and making baseball posts and content and God, people are just pissed off right now. They, they, they're upset at the Rockies and the season hasn't even started. And I get that that's hard on players and on coaches, but you know, you, you also have to recognize that you you've got to earn it. And whether you take that upon yourself or you take that upon yourself, you know, your, your collective as a team, 
they've got to start taking those steps, uh, you know, to, to get back into the, in, into the picture again. And, um, you know, and if let's say for in some miracle, they're a playoff contending team this year, uh, it's going to be the greatest thing. I mean, we will literally be the greatest sports market in the country. And we already, I feel like are in this yeah. moment currently, but I mean, mm-hmm. um, you know, if the Rockies can just get into a playoff contending spot, I, I would I would make a good argument that Denver is, would currently be the the most talented overall sports market in the country. I, I think the only other market that you could talk about having the same amount of su- success in as many sports would be Boston around the the late two thousands early twenty tens when the Red Sox were competing for a while. The Bruins won their yeah. last Stanley Cup during that period, and Brady was in New England. Unfortunately, yeah, no, and I and I mean it more of just like in right now, currently. Yeah, yeah, you know, right, I mean, right. you could you could make the argument that yeah, there's nobody else LA close has currently. Had, yeah, no, exactly. And from a from a across the board, you know, I'm not mm-hmm. saying that the Broncos are the best team in, in all of the country, or you know, the the, the I mean, whatever the Nuggets are the best team in the country. No, but across the board, on all the on all the major sports. Yeah, every single team except for the Rockies right now is a playoff slash championship contending team. That's a fun, fun thing to be as a sports fan. I've been in a lot of markets where that hasn't been the case. And I've also been lucky in a lot of ways because I got to be a, a di- I got to grow up a Giants fan when the Giants won three World Series in five years. I got to be in Seattle becoming a, a football fan with the Seattle Seahawks when they won, won a Super Bowl, uh, rest in peace, Bron- Broncos. And then, you know, got whooped the next year in the, on the yeah. one yard line. But, uh, but, you know, I got to be a part of that. And so, you know, there, it, there is nothing better, even when it's just one team, let alone your entire market. And that's, that's pretty cool. All right. So before we wrap this thing up, I need your, uh, your predictions for the MLB season. It's obviously, this is, we're, we're recording this late March and these aren't going to be coming true until the end of October. So I need your AL champion, your NL champion, and who is winning the World Series as it sits currently for the 2022 MLB season? Oh man, AL I knew champion. I was gonna. I, I knew I was gonna throw this one at you at the end to try and stump you. No, that's okay. I I, I think I've got a decent idea. AL champion, I got to go with the Red Sox. I like what the Red Sox have done so far this off season. They've made some moves, um, and they're still good. They they were a good team last year. They're going to be good this year. Um, I, I think they have what it takes to be that top team. Um, I think on the NL side, I hate to say it, but the Dodgers are still a legit force. And, you know, I, I think in the, the, in the NL West, I'd love to say that the Giants are going to be able to put together a season that they had last year. I just, oh God, I, I, I have a hard time believing that they can do that two times in a row. And they had to literally be the best team in all of baseball from a record standpoint to even get to the playoffs with the Rockies or with the, the Dodgers, excuse me. And they and they still lost in this in a crazy seven game series. I mean that was that was the World Series right there for me. Honestly, yeah. I mean that was so that was so much fun. Um, but you know, I just for it being that hard and them being that good last year, I can't see them doing that again. I just can't see them being on that level, even if they are still good and still a playoff team. Um, so I got to give it to the Dodgers. I think it's going to be yeah, Dodgers Red Sox, and I think I think we go again. ESPN is going to be very happy. Um, the Dodgers are one of those teams that at this point they're going to teams have to prove that they can beat them and be better Uh than them consistently. They're pretty much penciled in as my NL pick until, until they lose out and and lose all these star players that they have unlimited money for. That's going to be pretty much my NL pick for forever. I'd like to say that the Yankees are going to be my AL champion, but the Yankees are going in the opposite direction. They're, they're like, a step there the middle of the ladder the Rockies are at the bottom the Yankees are at the middle and they're heading towards the Rockies in terms of going up or down because yeah they felt like they put together their championship roster the last two years and it, it's not been close to what what a championship and, and roster maybe, consists of and maybe they need to change it up a little bit because you're right you know you got Stanton and Judge and you know these guys Sanchez who are who are studs I mean these dudes are rock solid we, uh, we I mean I remember when we were in in Gunnison and on the talk show and we were talking like yeah the Yankees like they're they're the team right now that's it doesn't get any better than than what they have put together and they have not been good and to the points where we were actually like are they even going to make the playoffs like I don't you know that that's they're bad they're a bad team so for your sake I hope they can maybe figure it out but for the rest of the world's sake uh I hope the Red Sox can keep on keep on rolling 
that we already had a decade where we didn't win our first decade in like 110 years where we didn't win a world series championship. So I think we'll live with a couple more years of mediocrity before we buy our way back yeah. to another to championship number 28. Yeah. You guys just keep spending money yeah. and, uh, and the rest of us will just keep trying to win. That's basically how baseball works. Six teams spend yeah. money and everybody else is just trying to pick up the scraps <laughs> at the bottom. Uh, They're all just watching Moneyball over and over and over. Yeah. How do we do this? Yeah. Call Jonah Hill. Really being, yeah. Call Jonah <laughs> Hill right now. That's not him. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for uh, jumping on. And, you know, th- we haven't had any baseball content for a long time. So this was long overdue. I appreciate you uh, coming on. And we'll have to I'll, – I'll make sure Nico and I pay attention a little bit more when baseball actually starts heating up. Maybe we'll have you on in the in the summer again to kind of recap midway through the year when uh, NFL is not quite started yet and basketball and hockey have, have passed. But I can't tell you how much I appreciate you jumping on the show and it's always a blast uh it's reminiscent i feel like i'm back in in uh taylor hall in the studio <laughs> right hey dude I, not, it doesn't get better than that and yeah I, I gotta make a deal with you though if the rockies are in first or second place in the division by all-star break you got to have a rocky segment in your in your, your show every week i think that i think that's a fair wager i'll, I'll go ahead and take I, that action. i think you're i think you're pretty safe right yeah. now but if they're in first or second place come all-star break you got to start following the baseball a little bit more. <laughs> I, I think that's a fair, that's a fair trade to make. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and put money. I'll put my, uh, our, our stake behind that. I, I like that bet a lot. There you go. There you go. Well, well Hey man, it's been a pleasure. Like you said, uh, brings us back to the good old days, but uh, um, yeah, no, it's always fun to come on and talk about baseball and, uh, and yeah, we'll have to come uh, catch a Rockies game at some point and have one of those good old Coors beers at Coors field uh, this go. summer. Yeah, uh, real quick, before we, we jump off, do you have anything that you want to let people know where they can find you, any projects that you're working on? I know uh, last time you were you were kind of going to do put try and put together some things yourself. Uh, you got any projects or any anything that you've been working on recently? Hey, for me right now, it's just it, it, I, I've been taking some time finishing up. I'm, I'm getting, I've just finished my master's, so mm. I, I've been taking the last month or so to, to just be studying a lot, which is – sucked but it's it's done now so now i can kind of really get back into the swing of things uh broadcasting wise and start to put some stuff together but but really what i want to what i want to do is just uh, you know i, I really want to hype up the, the denver sports media market right now and i know my wife is a part of it you're a part of it you know but like just just the the excitement right now that's in denver i can't stress enough i mean being from out of town having just moved here a few months ago it's super cool to see how everything has come together and the, the place that we're in. And like I said, even if, even if none of the teams win a championship, just the fact that we get to be in this and talk about this and be excited, embrace it, follow as many different sports media people as, as you can uh, accounts here in Denver and uh, just embrace this excitement that we have right now, because it's rare. We're blessed. And uh, I'm just excited to be in it right now. Couldn't have said it better myself. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this special bonus baseball edition of the Far End of the Bench podcast. Be sure to follow at FEOTB pod on all of our social media. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll be able to see this video uh, interview on our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe there and uh, let Christian know what you think about uh, his, his predictions or way too early predictions. Hopefully when we have him back on, he'll be able to respond to some of your comments. So comment on there and uh, catch us coming back to you on Wednesday. Nico makes his grand return coming back next week. So for the far end of the bench, myself, Jimmy Pilato, and uh, our guest this week, Christian Saez. Thank you very much for tuning in. We will catch you guys next time.